I grew up in Compton, California, an inner city of Los Angeles, with a reputation for drugs, violence, and arguably the best rap music. But my childhood tells of a parallel story. See, my time there was richly immersed in the arts. My family owned and operated a performing arts academy at the local elementary school. From the outside looking in, we were keeping kids off the streets. But from my vantage point, I came from a family of artists and entrepreneurs. See, my maternal grandmother, affectionately known as Nana, was a classically trained opera singer who sang in 13 different languages. She followed in the footsteps of my great-grandmother, who sang in 20 different languages. I was the first girl grandchild in two generations, and naturally, the next in line. So from ballet to drama, you could think of my life as a Beyonce training school. <laughs> but one day, with teeth missing, and pigtails in my hair, I had to give Nana some really tough news. Nana, I don't want to be a singer. I want to be a doctor and help babies. Surprised by my news, she smiled and said, there's no reason why you can't be a doctor. See, I knew that I would use my gifts to enrich the world around me, just like Nana, but that it was gonna look a little different. And medical professionals from my hood, they were black, Latinx, Asian, white. They looked like everybody. Now, this parallel story is divided by a limited view, bias. And I want to share with you my journey of becoming a scientist and why I think that by taking the blinders of bias off, we can all unlock our full potential. So fast forward, I get accepted into graduate school, into Stanford's Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. I was excited to be a biomedical scientist. As a black woman, I would be able to give a voice to a population not traditionally represented in science. But I felt the duality. I felt the duality of feeling overwhelmed because I have to show up to this predominantly white institution with the assigned lab labels of black, woman, first generation, low income, all of which didn't tell the full story of who I am when I look in the mirror. As scientists, we share our ideas at conferences and meetings. And I attended my first symposium on maternal child health. A speaker was coming to the podium to share his work on premature labor. He was looking at prematurity risk by race. He concluded that black birthing mothers had the highest risk based on race. Now I was confused because the first thing that popped into my head was how does body mass index, patient samples, or even medical history influence risk? See, this is an example of biological bias. I felt disappointed because patients that look like me, black women, were seen as less than simply because he was missing the bigger picture. 
Dorothy Roberts, a law and Africana studies professor at the University of Pennsylvania, defines biological bias as this. It's the misinterpretation of race as a biological category, when in reality, it's a social and political construct with biological consequences. Why can't we recognize that bias is a deterrent to progress? Later, a study came out explaining that racism is an upstream factor repeatedly linked to serious health consequences that could lead to premature labor. This story highlights how we need diverse perspectives in order to interpret the data to make it sound and robust. And in order for that to happen, we need to have diverse voices in the room. This led me to my next insight, a lesson on why I believe that diversity is the key to unlocking our true potential. Maybe if I could participate in discussions in a more intimate lab setting, I would be able to be a part of the ideas when the science is beginning. I joined a lab in the obstetrics and gynecology department. We studied human placenta related disease. Why? Because every two minutes, a pregnant person dies in the United States. And from the moment I began talking till right now, two people have already died. Can you believe it? I was in the position that I told Nana I would always be. Using my skills to be able to help moms and babies. On this particular day, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my boss. We were preparing for my upcoming qualifying exam. My boss became frustrated as I began to ask questions about all the changes that were being made. My boss said, why do you have to talk back? This won't serve you well. I was frozen by the audacity of that comment. I nervously answered, for you to correct my understanding. I have to present these slides during the exam. At that point, I realized that my participation in discussion up until that point was interpreted as hostile. And if I wanted to participate in discussion moving forward, I had to wait until my boss called on me first. Now, how can I contribute to the field of maternal fetal medicine if I can't speak? As a reproductive stem cell biologist, I do research in a field where black women, someone like me, is three times more likely to die during childbirth. And at the time, my research on human placenta stem cells was at the early stages of uncovering significant limitations on the current protocol being widely used in the field. Silencing meant that my experiments were stalled while experiencing performative inclusion during lab meetings. Bias shows up and how we treat one another. 
and I was ready to quit. I couldn't understand why. We couldn't understand that equity is excellence in a professional community. I grew up and was given my voice at a young age while experiencing community enrichment and advocacy. I saw the black women with resilience and creativity fulfill their purpose and navigate discrimination. But in scientific research, we're expected to solve complex medical mysteries, but there's just one problem. Disease doesn't care about bias. Would you drive a car with no windows or mirrors? In the same way, bias sabotages our ability to make medicine because it creates blind spots. And we can't solve what we can't see. I knew that if I was going to move forward, I wasn't going to be able to do it alone. I remembered a conversation that I had with a School of Medicine staff member. She advised me to treat my career like a company. And what does any successful company need? A board of directors. She explained that I shouldn't make any decisions about my career without first consulting my board. And my board was a group of scientific experts in my field who always made me feel seen and heard. So I began to hold regular meetings with them, provide research updates, and even made presentations in the fellow labs. And would you know, something amazing happened. I ended up expanding my board into a scientific network of staff, faculty, fellow trainees, industry scientists, even previous lab members. Sharing ideas and receiving meaningful feedback helped me to develop a strong scientific acumen. Their voices became louder than the regular silencing I was experiencing during meetings of demeaning put downs and comments. Anyone in your life that, make, that just gets you, they make you feel safe and accepted. I'm a member of many organizations that provides this community to me. I want to be able to highlight three of them for you today. The first is Cohort Sisters, an online platform committed to advancing equity in doctoral education. I should mention this to you before, but black women in the United States only account for 3% of doctorate degree holders. And black women are also delayed an additional 2.7 years on top of the time to degree completion due to lack of support and mentorship. Through this platform, I was able to sign up for a dissertation writing partner. She was a fellow doctoral mom at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And for the past two years, we've been supporting one another in the final stretches of our doctoral journeys. Second is a partnership for the advancement of imaging research, a group of underrepresented scientists 
that are faculty, postdocs, and graduate students. We attend monthly strength building sessions and participate in training courses around the country. Here we are at the Allen Institute in Seattle, Washington. The last is a pipeline program. These career pathway programs have been transforming the workforce by meeting the demands of evolving technology. I mean, do you possess the skills for jobs that haven't even been created yet? I sure didn't. And the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine filled that gap for me. CIRM was created to advance scientific research. And one of the major components of this institute is workforce training. As a CIRM alumna, I was a fellow at San Francisco State University. To date, CIRM has trained over 4,000 fellows, conducted over 100 clinical trials, and expanded research for 85 different diseases. If we're going to unlock our true potential, even in medicine or any field that you find yourself in, we're going to have to take the blinders off. And to unlock our true potential, we need to recognize bias as a deterrent to progress. We need to understand that equity is excellence in any professional community. And finally, that we should embrace diverse perspectives and backgrounds. Today, I take my place in history as the second black woman to receive a PhD in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine.